Okay. Then, Margaret, I'm going to say a few words about how this is. Ever since um, the renovation was completed in 2007 and we got vastly expanded exhibition spaces, we had um, discussed the idea of, of having an exhibition of works by contemporary Native American artists. Um, the real push, though, came in 2010. When there, was a, uh, the, when there were preparations going on all over the Upper Valley to uh, celebrate the 250th anniversary of the chartering of uh, 12 so-called middle ground towns throughout the Upper Valley, and Lebanon being one of them. And uh, that, we thought that that would be the perfect opportunity that sometimes in 2011 that Ava um, uh, had an exhibition uh, featuring uh, work that honored the native people. Uh, so, at the same time, uh, or a little later, after we had initiated the plans, we became aware of the fact that uh, the Good Museum was going to have an exhibition of native uh, of American art from their extensive collection. And we are very pleased, by the way, that the Good Museum's uh, new director, Michael Taylor, is here with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, we felt that there couldn't be a better opportunity than to schedule our exhibition to take place um, uh, during the same period. Of course, ours is uh, last for a very brief time compared to, to the Hoods uh, Museum. Ours is also smaller, in, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's important. It's any less than that of the Hoods Museum. Um, Margaret Jacobs, Ava's exhibition coordinator, who herself is an exhibiting artist here, beautiful work that is scattered around in the various galleries. Um, she started then planning uh, the exhibition, contacting the artist, and, and did a tremendous job putting it all together. So I want to thank Margaret for the wonderful work that she has done, and uh, Brian for being so willing to talk, and now I will let Margaret introduce Brian. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Mensa. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, so, Brian is currently a senior lecturer in photography at Dartmouth College. No. Um, his platform playing in photographs is a documentary tradition in its current imagery. It's based on the ritual of taking of snakes. Um, he received his BFA from the student purchase in New York and his MFA from Yale University. He has exhibited widely in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and his images and writing have been published in numerous books and periodicals. And I think it's just wonderful that we have Brian here today. Um, I know I, I have a side of little bit unusual because um, I never really I never really get to hear Brian speak about his work. So it's very exciting that um, he's able to explain the process. And uh, I think he's just a great uh, storyteller. And so you know, thank you for everybody for being here today. And please uh, help me welcome Brian. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to mention. Thank you, Margaret, for the introduction. And also, I should tell everyone that her work in the show is my wife's favorite work in the show, <laughs> including my so Everyone should check it out. Um, probably the obvious question to answer before I get into this is how do I fit into a show of Native Americans? I'm what you'd call a half-breed. I'm half Mohawk, half Irish, and the Irish was a little dominant in this case. <laughs> I grew up partly on a reservation for off and on for most of my childhood. Uh, last time I went there was in 1999. I'll probably never go back at this point in my life, but I could never, I don't know, didn't do it for me somehow. I wanted to be out in the larger world, although I kept feeling like I was pulled back there, but I have a crazy family member up there who's probably best avoided. And he made that very clear last time I was there. <laughs> As long as he's alive, I'm not welcome to the reservation. So, so there's that. Um, I'm going to show you guys a little bit of old work first, and then we can talk about the snakes. And if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt and answer. Um, 
This is really the first picture that I ever took that I thought meant anything to me. And I didn't, I just got this uh, view camera for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a large format camera, it's a fellows, you shoot one sheet of film at a time. I had heard you could do something kind of like what Cezanne did with view camera, and I didn't know what that was, but I knew I wanted to do it. And my interpretation of that was I started messing around with the, the, the adjustments you can make with the camera, and suddenly this table just flipped up. And then I thought, oh yeah, that's what Cezanne did, if he had a camera, it wasn't the camera. And I just love that sense of drawing in this picture. This is a picture of my grandparents. Um, it just really did something that I didn't expect to see in a photograph, and that, that really hooked me in photography. The photography was significantly more complicated uh, drawing system than, than I'd imagined up until that point in time. Um, I was photographing my surroundings, family members, people I cared about, uh, mostly just their stuff. I thought there was some kind of big conceptual framework for it, but I, in retrospect, I realized I was just into the way a camera draws. Really, just in the formal qualities. This one I included just to, to really emphasize how painfully formal I got. I was, you can't really tell in the picture, but I'm crumbling up pieces of Kleenex and outlining the edges of things and hiding things behind other things to make the edges pop out more. So it really was more about drawing than it was about whatever that's a picture of. Uh, when I started to realize what I was doing, I immediately wanted to stop doing it. And I started doing these drawings at chalkboards that were based on Da Vinci's drawings. I'd spend about a month drawing. It's really freaking hard to draw on a chalkboard and get any tonality. And if you lift the chalkboard up, it all falls off. So you have to lay it on the floor, draw on it, kind of drop, crumble up chalk into it. It's like finger painting. And then I'd photograph it, and then I'd process the film. And if it looked okay, I'd erase it and draw another one because at that point in my life I couldn't afford two chalkboards. And I did a whole bunch of these. They were all more or less based on Da Vinci's drawings. I, I thought of this is uh, just a, an interesting technique for making photographic images. I didn't have the three dimensionality you normally would have in a photograph. I couldn't take the camera anywhere. I couldn't interact with the real world in any way. I like the idea of really painfully limiting myself and seeing what I can get at. But I'm really not sure if I got much. Um, these, I can never seem to get anybody to show these, but I still want them. But from that, I started photographing uh, photocopies. I just take photocopies, cut them up, put them back together, still sticking with Da Vinci's drawings. Uh, da Vinci was kind of a, I guess, a symbol. I was really interested in thinking about as an artist, that I could take something of what he did if I, if I made artwork that was about him. It was almost an excuse for making artwork. And the photocopies were reconfiguring his drawings from multiple photocopies of the same drawing. So I find a book that was published in like the 1800s and photoc photocopied the etchings that they used to reproduce his drawings. And I find one published in the 90s and I photocopy that and then I cut the pieces out and start putting them together and, and use books from different time periods. I mean, they're just radically different ways of reproducing the image. And start trying to complete this drawing that he never completed using his sketches and his drawings. Never went anywhere. But around the end of it, I got frustrated and folded up one of the photocopies. And this, this brought me back into a sense of space, photographic space. Again, this picture blew my mind doing this, and it's just a really simple way of uh, treating a piece of paper. There's nothing, nothing special about this picture, but I think I felt like it freed me up in a way to do things that I just hadn't really conceived of before. You know, when I was photographing out in the in the real world, it was just I was just dealing with what was there, what was given to me. When I started constructing things to, to be photographed, I really had to consider everything. And at that point, space was almost too much to consider. So I feel like I taught myself space in the photography from the ground up. And it, it did really change the way I thought about photographic images. I was also working in advertising at the time, which I hated. I hated everything about it, and I hated all the people I worked with. <laughs> so, so it was fun to come home and, and smash ads. And I remember when I made this picture, I uh, just 
took two, two cards, smashed them together. I made something explode behind there to get ashes and flames, but I liked the picture without the ashes and flames better. And I kind of thought I was a genius at figuring this picture. <laughs> Do you see the drawing in the background? Yeah. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Just that I have to point this out. There's actually two different kinds of birds here. There's the classic M bird, and then there's a profile bird. You rarely see those two together in one drawing. I did that drawing. And then I got a little more sophisticated about how, what I could do by crumbling a paper and getting space. And it was still Da Vinci drawings. I was still thinking about them. And I had a meeting with somebody in New York about talking about showing my work. And they hated all this stuff. They used to, they liked my old work. They told me, really like your old work. You don't like this at all. This is horrible. What were you thinking? And I felt like I really wanted to keep going with this. And I came home, got frustrated, grabbed the first photocopy of my stack of photographs and twisted it up into a tornado. And just conveniently, it was a page about it, Dimensions to Blue's drawings. And I made a bunch of these, but this one to me just stands out as the best one. From there, I'm giving a very abbreviated version of all this. I got really excited about any kind of disaster, anything horrible that can happen. Uh, I was trying new earthquakes. I couldn't figure out how to make an earthquake out of paper in my studio, but I did figure out how to make nuclear explosions out of, of used Kleenexes. So I tried to get myself to be allergic to something, like I didn't have pepper or dust and blow my nose and collect all the nasty Kleenexes and make these things out of to kind of equate the, the explosion with the sneeze. And I made these, I didn't even want to work in a studio anymore. I made these in my living room, my house, and in the real print you can see there's furniture in the background, even a piano. And then from that, I wanted something a little more subtle. And I read a book about how Da Vinci was equated with a spider, this like sneaky little artist making things that people can't really figure out. They don't know where they start, they don't know where they end. Uh, they're very complicated. And I just cut up one of the photocopies I had and just made the spider out of it. It's, um, it's sort of 3D. It's actually several planes of glass, panes of glass in front of each other with the strips of paper in between them and sometimes on them. And then I used the light from my windows to reflect in the glass so I'd get the reflections of the back side of it to make it look like there's a lot more going on. And I quickly got better at making them look more realistic. And then I got to the point where people thought they were realistic. And I had a show of just these, and somebody was asking me about them, and they said, wow, is this dangerous to do? <laughs> and I thought they meant, did I get cut from the glass? And I said, oh yeah, I got cut up a lot. <laughs> Sometimes it tips right over, and I had no idea what I was talking about. But it wasn't really. Uh, all the spiders are based on real spiders. It's very important to me that they, they be as, as anatomically accurate as possible. I used to know the names of what kind they are, but I can't remember it anymore. Uh, I was doing this type of work until I moved up here, and somehow moving to northern New England from the New York area just made I didn't want to do this anymore. Why would I want to be in a studio where I could be outside and do something else? And, I was sick of having to make the world. I wanted to experience the real world. And I would just go for these long drives and just look at things and not photograph. And then I got this idea that, well, if I should modify my truck and see what, if I can drive better using weird stuff in the truck. And I started making things out of wood, like replacing car parts with wooden versions or things made out of bone or things made out of stone. Usually it didn't work at all, but I got one night, I got my carburetor work using bat wing bones, and I went out for a drive, and I came to this place. This is, um, I think it's 25C up in Warford. Anybody from Warford? Yeah, 25C, right? A. A, okay, I can't remember. But anyway, I, I drove by there, and I saw a person standing on the side of the road there. And I didn't have a cell phone at that point in my life, and uh, so I pulled over to see if, if they were okay. And there was no car, but just somebody standing there. They seemed to be waiting for something or lost. I couldn't really tell. I got out of my truck, 
I went over, it was, there was a woman with a duffel bag, and I said, is everything okay? Do you need a ride somewhere? And she just wouldn't say anything. She wouldn't respond to me. She didn't say anything. She didn't look at me. She didn't seem to even hear me. And then I felt really uncomfortable I'm talking to someone who's not talking. I can't just turn around and leave. That'd be rude. And uh, I just started kind of babbling a little bit. I was just asking questions that just didn't matter. Like, Why are you here? What are you doing? Nice night, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually she kind of turned and looked at me and started walking towards my truck. And like, she threw her duffel bag right in the back of the truck and got in. <laughs> and I thought, I just, I just let a psycho get in my truck. <laughs> I'm going to get her out of there. <laughs> so I, I was getting really nervous at this point. Like, I, just, I was just trying to be polite. I didn't actually think she wanted to ride. And I started asking a bunch of questions. Like, where do you want me to drop you off? There's nothing around there that really, uh, I remember. But um, I knew a little ways from there, there was a bar called, was that, I think, the Third Rail. Is that something like that? people? Yeah. So I asked her if she wanted to go there. And she said, yeah. And so we went there. And we started talking, and that time, then she turned around and started asking me a lot of questions. And it seemed very calculated, which made me a little bit paranoid. Like, she was asking very specific things, like, like who lives with you? Like, who? <laughs> <laughs> and I just didn't know what to make of it, but I, I felt like this is like, you know, this is kind of a gift. Like, I gotta see how this plays out. I'm just too curious. And I talked to her, and she wouldn't tell me much of anything about her, but. It was kind of an interesting conversation. I, I got that she was pretty well educated. She was a few years younger than me. I was probably 30 then, and she was probably 26 or 7, I was guessing. She never told me. Uh, we, we talked about novels, mostly. Um, she hadn't read any ones I was asking her about, but she seemed to know things about them, which kind of intrigued me. And eventually, she started talking about photography. I told her I was a photographer. And she said, well, why don't you photograph me? And I said, well, what do you mean? She's like, well, why don't you let me stay at your place and you can photograph me? <laughs> so I said, hell yeah. <laughs> and she did. And, but I wanted to know a lot of questions. I didn't really want to photograph her at first. I just wanted to know what was going on. And I, I asked her why she was out there. And she wouldn't really be clear about it. And she had with a small bag of stuff, a duffel bag that had, I didn't really go why eventually I went through it, but at that point I had this lipstick called Trailer Trash that was this thick kind of brownish purple stuff that, and I just loved the name. And I, the first picture that we did, I just made her put a lot of it on. Got the camera as close as I could possibly get so you can see all the nastiness in the lipstick and photographed it. I thought about doing it in color, but I like it so much better than black. And what was that? Man Ray. We just like the Man Ray show. Oh, did he do a lips picture? He does the big lips, yeah. I don't remember that. Miller and Man Ray. Yeah, I know Lee Miller very well. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look for that one. I probably have seen it something somewhere. After this picture, she didn't like the way this worked out. She didn't like me telling her what to do to be photographed. Instead, she wanted to decide what she was going to do. So I'd come home from work at night, and, and I'd make dinner, and then we'd go out and photograph. And we'd usually stay out most of the night and photograph. And then I'd have to come back and teach classes at dark. And I was exhausted. And people I'd worked with thought there was something wrong with me. because I was tired. The students thought I was just a useless teacher. And, but I was, I was just taking advantage of <clears throat> the moment. I just thought, I've got to get as much film as I could possibly get. And so we would just go out and photograph, and she would just do whatever she wanted to do. She'd start doing something as I was sitting with the camera. This camera takes about 15 minutes to an hour to set up, depending on what I want to do. Uh, I didn't really, couldn't bring too much equipment, so I just brought the camera and used the truck headlights to illuminate whatever she was doing. She would sometimes bring things, sometimes she wouldn't bring anything, sometimes she just wander around. Sometimes she would not cooperate at all. A lot of times she would try to make it impossible for me to photograph. Like if I wanted to hold still, she'd jump around. Or if I wanted to jump around, she'd hold still. Uh, a couple of years later, I noticed like, that in a lot of the places on the truck, 
where I photographed her or where she touched, the area started to rust away. All of her handprints rusted away in the truck. And here's two of the best ones you can see. Um, I thought that was scary and <laughs> Googled it and it turns out that's actually a known phenomenon. The military deals with that, that some people have really corrosive sweat and it's a real problem with guns that you can really mess up a gun bag. So a few things I know about her is she's very tall and she has corrosive sweat. <laughs> This was one where we were doing something else, and I just didn't like anything she was doing, but I had this lantern that was in the grass, and I just loved the way that happened, so I ignored her and photographed the lantern. She liked it to be kind of performative, like she would just like try to surprise me or catch me off guard or do something I didn't expect like this while I was photographing, trying to make there be some kind of narrative, like there was a, there's somebody supposedly in the car, she's performing for them, it's not me, I'm back behind the camera. There are all these weird stories she came up with. Um, some of the pictures I'm showing were taken long after the fact, where I, I redo some of the things that happened. This picture was taken in 2006, this is much newer, uh, and it's just that my memory of a shoot we did, and I just went back and redid it all by myself. And this is another time I went back to something. I, this is a place we often went to photograph. This is uh, the back roads in Orford off Indian Pond Road, if that means anything to anyone. Uh, this one I call Come On Back and Bring Your Temper Boy, because when I was out there, I was out with my dog, and a bunch of drunk guys showed up and wanted to know what I was doing and got vaguely threatening and then one of them said he was going to shoot my dog. So I hit him with my tripod <laughs> as hard as I could. And they left, but they, they yelled a lot. But, so I see this picture and that was a challenge for him to try that again. But then I got really scared. They were actually going to come back and I got the hell out of it. <laughs> but I don't like people threaten my dog. I kept asking her why she was out there, which her name is Sarah. I kept asking her, what are you doing out there? And eventually she told me that some, some guy tried to hurt her and she shot him. And she didn't know whether he was alive or not. And I didn't believe her. And then she pulled this gun out of her bag and just put it on the table. And I remember I picked it up. I kind of looked at it. I grew up handling guns. I know I'm not, I have no problem with them. Uh, I checked it. It was mostly loaded. <laughs> a few rounds were missing. And then I did something really stupid. I sniffed it because I remember TV people sniff guns to see if they've been fired recently. And as far as I could tell, it smelled like a gun. And I, I didn't know why I did that, and I was totally embarrassed by that, but I sniffed it. Uh, and then I realized I just put my hands and my nose all over a gun that made me a murder weapon. And I tried to clean it. She didn't seem to have any interest in anything about it, so I decided I was going to keep it. I wasn't going to give it back to her. She didn't care. I took all the bullets out. I threw them out in the field. This is where I threw them. At the night, I threw them. I just scattered them all there. And cleaned the gun off as best as I could. It found a place underneath my fridge I could hide it and hid it there. I still have it. She never wanted it back. Uh, I don't think anybody actually got murdered. So after that, I did height of paranoia. I called one of the ranger stations up near where we were, I forget which one, and I told them that I was out there and I heard a lot of screaming and gunshots and I asked if anything had happened or if they'd heard anything. And they said no, they didn't hear anything. No one called, nobody complained about anything. So I'm pretty sure nothing really happened. This was just a, a vague threat she was making. Whose hands were in the picture? Those are her hands. Yeah, it looks, it looks better. Yeah, they're not mine. It was funny the way she held it. It was like it, like it was a puppy or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was kind of creepy. <coughs> uh, this is a, a weird thing that happened when we were out one time. The, this is an old truck. It's a 1966 Ford pickup. I don't have it anymore, but 
it, it had some issues. And plus, I was replacing parts of it with organic things. I, I hadn't treated it very well. But one night when we were out, I couldn't get it started again. And we weren't that far from home. We were only a few, five or six miles, I think. But it was too cold to try to walk home, so we just stayed in the truck that night. And it was, I think it was October or November, I can't remember exactly anymore. Uh, the next morning when I got up, I found a dead rattlesnake like right in front of the truck. And I've never seen a live rattlesnake up here. It really surprised me. And I tried to get the truck started and realized that in the carburetor, the float was leaking, and the float is the thing that shuts off. That only lets a little bit of fuel in at a time. If it leaks, you flood the engine every time you try to start it. So I, I took the rattlesnake rattle and used that as a float, and I got us home. <laughs> but then when I got home, just to emphasize what a badass thing I did, I put the snake skin over the filter so everybody can see it. It's too hard to see that. One of the, the rules that we had was I wasn't allowed to show her face in photographs. But I started to notice that she didn't seem to care in that she wasn't aware of it. She seemed like she really knew what was going on photographically. And I just started taking pictures of her face and I didn't, didn't worry about it and she didn't seem to mind. So there she is. She told me her name was Sarah, but whenever I said Sarah, she didn't respond like it was her name. She kind of responded like she didn't think about it, so I'm pretty sure it's not her name. Around three weeks into it, I came home from work one night, and she said she needed to go. It was time to leave. Uh, wasn't, she didn't have to leave right then, but she had to leave that week. And I said, okay, fine. I didn't really want her to go. I got I got used to her really enjoying her being around. And I said, I'll take you wherever you need, New York, Boston, whatever it is, I'll, I'll take you there and make sure everything's fine. And then she didn't talk about it again for another couple of days. But then I think it was Wednesday, she, I, I came home and she said, I need to go tonight. And I thought, oh God, I'm going to go to New York or Boston tonight. I was hoping we could do a weekend. She was at it. She had to go that night. I said, okay, where, where do you want me to go? And uh, she said she wanted me to take her right back where I found her, back on 25 May, and just leave her there. And I, we got a huge argument about that. I just didn't understand why. It didn't make sense. It didn't seem safe. There were too many houses around there. But eventually, I just had to do what she wanted, so I did. She didn't want to bring any of her stuff, so she didn't want to bring any of her clothes or her duffel bag or her lipstick. Uh, over the course of three and a half weeks, I bought her some clothes. I even, she even made me cut her hair. But, uh, so she took the clothes I bought her, but she didn't want to take any of her old stuff. So I still have the duffel bag full of stuff. I don't know what to do with that. It's in my attic you now. But, and she left. So I went through, I did photograph some of her stuff. And that's, that's her dress, the dress that she's wearing most of the pictures. I just hung it up in the tree. So, one, this is three and a half weeks worth of work. I didn't talk to any about, anybody about what I was doing because I wasn't comfortable talking about it at that point in time. And people would sort of ask, well, what are you up to? You seem to be working all the time, but nobody sees anything you do. And a year later, an artist in residence was Barbara Grossman. Do you, if you guys know her, she was really getting on my case. Like, what are you working on? I found this I picked up a hitchhiker. She lived with me for three and a half weeks in a photograph. And then it made it easier to say, I felt like if I'm going to do work like this, I've got to be comfortable talking about it. I can't think it's weird. You guys can think it's weird, but I have to be okay with it. <laughs> so I became okay with it, and I started showing the work around, and, and that, was, that was great. And it, you know, I got, got a bunch of shows, got a bunch of residencies, and you know, did well. Uh, there was a, a Hollywood screenplay that written about this that I'm hoping will one day become a movie, but it... It went in a direction I didn't really like. I got killed in it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm waiting to see what happens. <laughs> and then a few years later, I, I met my wife. We got married. We bought a house down about two hours south of Warford. Uh, and we were renovating it. And we moved to Norwich, Vermont, temporarily while we were renovating the house. And we lived off Beaver Meadow Road. I can't remember the name of the road we lived 
lived on. It was off Beaver Meadow. And there was a church there. And the church is, is in a Paul Sample painting at the hood. Yeah. yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. So Mitchell Brook Road? That sounds familiar. It's near the <coughs> I can't remember the dirt road. That means it. Mm. But anyway, I the the church was, was there and my wife wanted to go check it out one day. My wife's name's Beth. Beth wanted to check it out. Uh, we, we went there, and I've got hang-ups with churches. I don't like to go in churches. I was raised fundamentalist and got a lot of issues with that. And so I thought, I'll just wait outside. I don't, I'm not comfortable going in there. And she just loves the architecture. So she's in there looking around, and this little tiny guy came up to me while I was out there. He, he was talking to me. It turned out he was a preacher. Uh, I thought of that church. And he was asking me all these questions. And, yeah, since I was raised in that environment, I just I was kind of playing along. I wanted to see what he wanted, really, and we just talked about a bunch of things. Uh, inevitably, if you talk to fundamentalists for too long, you, you start talking about the end of days, and he believed the end of days was right around the corner. Any day, you know, it's going to happen. And I kind of love talking about that sort of thing, so I, I listened and conversed and pretended to agree with him. And he said that he has a, a little following little congregation that meets and they, they do actually see God. This isn't, isn't that kind of, like he referred to the church as bullshit, and like that bullshit. And I said, what do you mean? I thought, I thought he was the preacher at that church. He said, no, we just do it in my car. And so he lived near me. He lived right down the road from me. So I started just going over to visit. He liked, what was it? He liked coarse light. So if I brought coarse light over, he would talk to me until the coarse light was gone. And then he didn't want me around. Uh, he had a yard that looked kind of like a junkyard. He had like old tractors and truck parts laying around, and he had a pool table up in his living room, and that, that was his prized possession. Um, I tried to photograph him. He would not cooperate at all. I wanted to photograph the pool table, but he thought people saw it. They tried to break into his house and steal it. But eventually, he, he did let me photograph his bedroom, and that's where he slept. And he was very well armed just in case anything happened. He was convinced that there were all kinds of people out to get him, usually of ethnic groups that he didn't like. And he had, he had a range of ones he liked less than others. And, uh, but he was kind of, he was still interesting. I wasn't ready to just dismiss him as just being a, a racist. So I kept going over, I kept bringing the course light, and he would just tell me things. And eventually he said, you know, do you want to, do you want to see God? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. And he said, well, we're going to have a get-together. We don't do it every weekend, but we're going to have a get-together at my place on Sunday. And he gave me a list of things I was not allowed to do the week before. And it was an extensive list. Like, and it was a lot of things I'd like to do. And I didn't know what that meant, so I didn't worry about it. And I did all the things I liked to do. I didn't worry about any of the things I wasn't supposed to do. And one of them was drinking coffee, another was eating cheese, and I drink coffee every day, so I, I just did it all. So I, I got to this place, I was the first one to get there since I lived so close. I walked, my wife wanted nothing to do with this. She thought it was stupid, it was creepy, and why on earth would I be buying into this crap? So I went to it, and it was, he was all happy, it was like, I think we started at 10 or 11 in the morning. He had one of those turkey deep fryers, and he was cooking something in it. And while I was cooking it, he was pulling up grass and throwing grass in it, too. And he said, this is the sacrament. You know, we're all going to drink this, and that's how we see God. <laughs> so I go, oh, I get it. <laughs> so I was open to that. I'll try that. I didn't believe anything was going to happen. It was grass. I mean, I saw him throw the grass in. Uh, I did ask about that, but I don't think grass has hallucinogenic properties. And he's like, well, don't worry about grass, that's not, that's not, that's the least of your concerns. And he, other people came, we didn't interact at all. I mean, I don't even know who the other people were who were there. He would send them off to different parts of his land. So I was sitting in the final track, and then he'd come around and let us have a drink of it. It was like a, like a big coffee mug full. It was nasty stuff. It tasted like boiled grass, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or what I would imagine at that point, what boiled grass would taste like. And then he'd go off and he'd talk to other people. He'd kind of wind his way around. So I drank it, and, and nothing was happening. 
and I was just waiting. I was wondering what this was. I tried to think back, like, could you have snuck a little mescal in there? Maybe I'm going to have one of those peyote type trips, or, or could, could you just dump the acid in there and like, really be a mess when I get home tonight? And then I started to feel like I was getting a cold back in my throat. My throat got really sore. And then my nose started running like crazy. It was just disgusting. And then I felt like I constantly had to sneeze and got a really throbbing headache. And as this was happening, I looked around and saw other people were throwing up. And I thought, oh my god, you, you just poisoned us. <laughs> yeah, now I know my wife didn't come. <laughs> and he came around, he's like, you didn't listen to my instructions. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, I told you, you listen to things you're not supposed to do, you did them. And I said, yeah. He said, well, you wouldn't have been sick if you didn't do them. Like, this is... You, know, you have to purify yourself before you can see God, and, that, and this was the process of being purified. Um, the other people were not, didn't see, I had what looked like a cold, a nasty cold. Nobody else seemed to have that. Everybody's eyes were watery, uh, and every, most people threw up. I didn't throw up. I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> and then after about a half an hour of just unbelievable misery, it all kind of went away. And then I started to really hallucinate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I was, I don't know what I was upside down or right side up, and there were things going on around me, and I could see all this stuff like circling around, and all the other people were, it seemed like they didn't move at all, but there was so much activity around us, it seemed like a murderer's house it was like crawling with animals. I saw snakes everywhere, um, I saw wolves everywhere, like on the fringes where snakes and wolves kind of watching us. And it lasted about 10 hours of this. And during that, he would come around and talk to you. And he'd sort of, he was actually kind of amazing. He wouldn't try to convince you of anything. In that state, you're very susceptible. If he told me that was God, I would absolutely believe it. And, but he just said that, you know, this is, this is your mind figuring things out. This is what you need to see. And you have to figure out what it all adds up to. And so I just tried to remember snakes and wolves, snakes and wolves, snakes and wolves. And it eventually kind of faded out, and people were getting ready to go home. And I then talked to a couple of the other people, and we all saw snakes and wolves. <laughs> Nobody didn't see snakes and wolves. <laughs> so it was really strange. It was big snakes, little snakes, most of the wolves that were black. That's what everybody seemed to see. So I didn't know what to make of that, but I wanted to do a black wolf picture. So. I went out on the land where I was staying at the time, and I took my dog Lola with me, and I threw the ball for her. And as she'd come back, I'd yell at her to stop, and that would get her to drop her head down so she looked more like a wolf instead of a friendly dog with a ball in her mouth. I talked to him a few more times, and he told me that he also uh, took up serpents, and he could, he could faith heal. Uh, he could speak in tongues. He could drink poison without any problems. And I said, oh, I got to see all of that. And at that point, he didn't like me anymore. He kind of realized I was just sort of curious, but I didn't believe any of it. And I keep showing up and bringing him coarse light, and he just wasn't friendly anymore. He didn't seem to want anything to do with me. And then he'd say really provocative things, like he'd say the most nasty, like, racist or homophobic thing you can imagine. And trying to get a rise out of me. I was like, biting my tongue not to say anything, just pretend you agree with it. I just, I just wanted to see the snakes. And eventually I just got, he wasn't going to cooperate. He wouldn't return my phone calls. Uh, and eventually I think he died. Somebody told me, no, I hadn't heard from him in years, and somebody told me that maybe he died. It wasn't really clear. Um, as I drove by the place, it just looked like a wreck. You know, last time, years ago, that I checked it out. He, he's had my phone a long time. So I kind of gave up on trying to get him to show me any of this stuff. And since I, I was raised uh, in a Pentecostal family, my family believes in faith healing and speaking in tongues and drinking poison and not drinking battery acid and not being hurt. Uh, but snake handlers were always kind of on the fringe, so I'd never seen that when I was a kid, but I'd always heard about it. Those were the extra religious people, the ones who were really hardcore. And they tended to live by themselves. And this is upstate New York, out in the rural parts of upstate New York. And I always wanted access, but my parents didn't like that. They didn't want me to have anything to do with those people. And 
I decided to try to track some of them down since I'd heard about them for so long. So I spent about three years like going from person to person to try to find this, a group of them. And eventually I tracked down two guys who do it in uh, Roscoe, New York. Anybody knows that town? Good diner there? Yeah. <laughs> and they said I could come out and I could talk to them. Um, and uh, I went out there. I thought I was going to photograph. I brought, uh, I brought all my gear. And um, we got there and they, they were kind of standoffish. They showed me a couple snakes. I took iPhone photos of the snakes. And, but they said that I can't photograph them. You know, they said, you can photo we'll let you photograph yourself doing this, but we're not going to do it. And I thought, I thought, that works, actually. That's better, because I don't believe this is any kind of a spiritual act. I like the idea of doing it and not believing. And I, I got kind of excited about the idea of doing that. But then they said, but you have to pay us $1,000. <laughs> so, so I thought, oh, this might not even work. I don't blow a thousand bucks for something that, where I might get bit. <laughs> so I did some research. I considered like maybe there's an easier way to do this, and then inevitably I started googling what happens if you get bit by a snake. Like what's what's the worst case scenario? And I didn't read as much as I should have because I found out after the fact it's way worse than what I thought. So I thought it wasn't that bad. I thought the worst thing that could happen is you could get gangrene, and I wasn't too worried about gangrene. I thought, my wife can get me to the hospital, you know, we'll have the anti-venom, we'll let the hospital know I might get bit. <laughs> we'll see. And I, I, I also felt like, you know, I love animals. I, animals love me. Animals walk right up to me in the woods. It's great. I have snakes all over my yard. I practice. I pick them up. I can tell when they want to bite. They're not venomous, but I felt really confident that I could do this. So we negotiated. I talked them down to $300. <laughs> And they came to my place, and it was $300, but they were going to do it for three times. So they showed up with, they, they let me pick out a snake. I picked Sally, that's her name. She's a cottonmouth. And she was the most docile snake they had. Uh, I wanted a rattlesnake. I really wanted something with a rattle, because I thought that would look so much better. It would be so much more clear in the picture. But whenever they picked up a rattlesnake, that thing just struck like crazy. It was just trying to bite anything. And I, I didn't need that. I don't have enough pills to calm me down for that. So we went with Sally, who was just really just a sweet little snake. Didn't seem to get particularly hostile, except when you occasionally did something you shouldn't do. Uh, the first day, they brought her a bucket, a Home Depot bucket with like wet straw in it. She liked her bucket. We have to put her back in her bucket every now and then. She got a little hissy. But, uh, First day, I just couldn't bring myself to pick her up, so I set her on a table, and I could just keep her on the table. Uh, she did strike at me once or twice, but she didn't strike fast, so I was able to pull my hands away. But I quickly realized there are things she likes, and it's like she makes it very clear if you're doing something she likes, that she's, she's happy with that. And one of the things she really liked is in the first picture over there, my hand being right there. And I didn't know why, but there's a guy at the opening who's a zookeeper who told me, well, that's, that's over her heart. Like, that feels really good to her. Like, that's like a belly rub to a dog. Like, that's <laughs> like the nicest thing you can do with a snake. And it calmed her right down. And so, that, so I got to the point where I'm, like, I could pick her up there. That was the place. I wasn't going to grab her by the tail or the head yet. Um, I could keep her on the table, no problem. She didn't get off the table. She didn't really try to. I had a studio strobe set up, but when they'd go off, the flash would go off, and that would freak her out. So I had to just do it by all the lights. So I moved the table right up next to the window to get as much light as possible. I've got the camera set up with a, a and most of these pictures with a bulb on the floor that I'm stepping on to take the picture. But I found that when I stepped on the bulb, I pushed her forward, and she didn't like that at all. So I eventually set it up on a timer. So I kind of know what was going to go on. I would focus on certain spots on the table and then try to get her to, to those spots. So I shot hundreds of sheets of film. Most of it's just weird, awkward tail pictures where you can't see much of her, but she's moving and getting away. But, but some of these worked out pretty well. Uh, the next day they came was a few weeks later. I was so ashamed of myself for not being able to pick her up. I was just going to do it. I wasn't going to think about it. I'll get her out of her bucket and pick her right up. And I did. There was no problem. I could tell that she liked the heat from my hand.
This one I originally didn't show. Big fang picture. I wasn't sure what I thought of that. It looked more aggressive than I wanted originally. But when I when I first showed this work, it, a lot of people didn't even realize it was like poisonous snakes. So I felt like I had to include it to set the context. Now the flashlight is there because I use that to focus my camera, and. The, her mouth just looks so interesting that I put the flashlight down, focused on the flashlight, brought her out, set her head down right in front of the flashlight so I could really illuminate her mouth and just see what was going on in there. This is one where I'm ashamed to say I dropped her. I had the camera set up on a timer and uh, I had her in my hands and she just got away and just jumped on, hopped on the floor. And I was crouching down to kind of keep her from getting too far all the time went on. But I ended up loving the picture. I also grew a big old beard before I did this, so I'd look more of the part. <laughs> and then this, these are some pictures from a little show I had a few years ago. I just wanted, it was a show in a place I didn't think anyone would go see it, so I wanted to try something totally different. If it failed miserably, it just didn't matter. So I did a bunch of color pictures of, of dogs, and it's, again, based on what I was seeing in the creature, uh, sleeping some hallucinogenics. And this is just my dog. I just went out with, actually, on my property with my dog, and I'd take dog food and scatter it all over in the snow, but I'd make her sit and wait, and then I'd set the camera up. I didn't even need a tripod for this and just let her go around and dig up all the dog food and take separate pictures. And then in Photoshop, you just put them all together. <laughs> this. this is a side project called Series of Wine Mirror. This is something I did with my wife, Elizabeth Duffy. Uh, fantastic artist, does just amazing things. She's getting ready for a show right now that opens in Delaware, I think this weekend. And this project is based on the Arnofini wedding portrait. Do you guys know anything about that? It's uh, one of the earliest oil paintings, right? Yeah. Beth was trained as a, a painter and knows a lot about that. I didn't know anything about that painting other than it's often been cited as evidence that he was using optical devices to make it, and that's what I liked about it. So we both had weird reasons for being kind of fascinated with this painting, so we decided to go into our own stuff and images that are things that are reminiscent of things in the painting. That's my share of her dress. That's one of our dog's paws. That's the other one. This is a mirror. This is a, in the back of the painting there's a, a mirror that shows the room and also the painter painting. It's kind of wild the way he did that. But con concave mirrors have been used to project images. So if he had a mirror like that, he certainly knew about that and could have used it. There's also a chandelier, we've since made a chandelier that looks like that, that uh, is clearly photographic in a way that was, was reproduced. It's just amazing. But I think that's it for slides. Do you guys have any questions about that or about the work up here? When you were handling the snake, did you have kind of spiritual no. power <laughs> I don't have those. <laughs> no. No, uh, when I was doing these, I was nervous and hyped up on caffeine. And, but not then. But not then, yeah. Um, I was less nervous in the ones where I'm actually picking her up, but the first day was pretty terrifying. <laughs> um, no, nothing spiritual. Why did you have hair They wouldn't. I wanted that. But they really didn't want to be photographed. Snake handling is illegal. So they didn't want any evidence of, of them doing it. So. How did your wife feel about it? She was not happy about that. <laughs> but what she, we made a deal. I would only do it three times. And my next project has to be way less dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to think of something that's less, and I feel like I've been evolving into like less 
dangerous projects anyways as I get older that I'm less inclined to put myself at risk. So she, when people ask her that, she says, well, it's better than what it used to be. <laughs> but that, the days I would do that, she'd just go out and do oh, something. Yeah. And, you know, she had her cell phone, and, kid, and I'd have her written number ready to call and get me to the hospital. We had it all mapped out. And I knew I had 24 hours before there was going to be any. It's going to hurt like hell, but 24 hours, I can probably, I'll probably be fine. Um, I since found out it really hurt me bad if I got bit. I shouldn't have been quite so Kevin. Yeah, I made the mistake of opening a book all about snake bites and seeing what actually happens. Horrible. So, so I'm never doing this again. Cat and mouse are not exactly user friendly. Well, this one oddly was, but they're known to be a more aggressive snake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a pretty docile one. Until you dropped it. Until what? Until you dropped it. Oh, yeah. No, she was fine with that, but yeah, I did worry. There's a lot of cursing when I thought the snake. <laughs> Whenever I take these pictures, I've got both of the guys who were the private practitioners standing on either side ready in case something goes wrong. And they've got like a hook on a stick that they can catch her with. And they're just big, they're just ready to go. So it's it's as safe as something like this could be. I once I got over being nervous about it, I really never felt like it was dangerous anymore. It just seemed like, like I had a, a relationship with her. I knew what not to do. I, I learned that anytime she looks at you, you did something wrong. And you better stop what you're doing, put her back in the pocket and go with what. But so as long as she's not looking at me, not paying attention to me, I was doing like that. Did her bucket have a tunnel? No. Uh, it did for transport, but we just, it was a Home Depot bucket, an orange bucket, with a bunch of wet straw in it. You put it in there and she just relaxes. Like my dogs with their beds. <coughs> so you mentioned the other day. Who are the photographers that you admire? Oh, Emmett Gowan is probably my all time favorite photographer. Um, and, so, you know, he's one of the first photographers I've really thought about. I, mean, I just can't see the shape. You know, he's early, but not as crazy about the areas. But I just love the pictures of his family. Uh, Joseph Sudek, I love his work too. I had a whole thing of the people that influenced me that I cut out of this. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, Sudek is fantastic. I'm very influenced by Jan Groover, who is a teacher of mine. In fact, that first picture is, is kind of referencing one of her photographs. If anybody knows who she is. Uh, she's a formless photographer. She has no interest whatsoever in content. I photograph the things that I do with content. It's just pointless. But she has a picture where she did a weird, that kind of weird thing with the edge of the table and made it sort of right angle with it, which is a really hard thing to do. So I wanted to try to do it in a new picture. It's kind of an homage to her with a snip. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs>